Grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The text for our meditation this evening is today's gospel from Mark chapter 6. In the name of Jesus, amen. Isn't this the carpenter? This question in today's gospel shows how easily Jesus can become an offense to the flesh. Luke tells us that when Jesus began his ministry in Galilee, after his temptation in the wilderness, he was glorified by all. But that didn't last long. Snarky remarks like those in today's text soon revealed a growing resentment and hatred toward him. And for what? He preached heavenly words, the very wisdom of God. He proclaimed himself the promised Messiah through whom forgiveness, life, and salvation would come for all repentant sinners. And what kind of response did he get? Contemptuous questions like, where did he get these things? And what is this so-called wisdom given to him? Isn't he just a carpenter? They could only see Jesus as the son of Mary and Joseph, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon. Just a man, they thought. Some of them probably knew him when he was a little child. The carpenter, probably a cabinet maker, since the houses themselves in Palestine were made out of stones. Isn't this the carpenter? They asked. And in this Seemingly innocuous question, we see the offense of the gospel at work. The fact is, they expected more out of their Messiah than what Jesus presented to the eyes of their flesh. He was just a man, as far as they could tell, and not a very impressive one at that. He wasn't even a priest or a member of the ruling class, just a carpenter. Nobody special. His plainness offends our flesh too, if we're honest. Our flesh looks for status, the symbols that men recognize, honor, and value. But the Son of Man is plain. His baptism appears to be simple water. His supper is no gourmet meal. Likewise, preaching. Luther said, or St. Paul said, we didn't come to you with lofty speech. The ministry of the church is not a glorious enterprise. But Jesus does what he came to do. Preach the acceptable year of the Lord, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Likewise, Paul preached at Antioch in Pisidia. Let it be known to you, therefore, brothers, that through this man, forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. That was Christ's message to them then, and it's his message to us Now, who Jesus is and what he came to do is visible only to the eyes of faith. Faith bestowed by God through the means of water and word. And few in his day saw it. Most turned away from it. Many resented it. In fact, it wasn't long before they conspired together as to how they might destroy him. And that's how it is today. The good that happens when we Christians proclaim the gospel is not seen by the eyes of flesh, only the eyes of faith. Jesus said, no one knows the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. But what faith sees, oh my. It sees God himself incarnate, 
holy and omnipotent. It sees the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the Savior of promise. It sees Jesus as God in the flesh, who by his suffering and death has ransomed us poor sinners from death. At the crucifixion, it was only the eyes of faith that saw and confessed, truly, this is the Son of God. As it is written, no eye has seen nor ear heard, Paul would later say. He would also write that the natural man cannot receive these things because they are spiritually discerned. In Christ, faith beholds the mystery of the wisdom of God. What we're looking at here involves what Luther called contraria, the contraries. My friend, the Reverend Dr. Alfonso Espinoza has recently published a book in which he calls these the dualities. We might see them as contradictory, but in God's economy of time, space, and existence, they're not really in contradiction. Was Jesus a carpenter? Yes. Was he also the son of the living God? Yes. God and man, human and divine, all at the same time. Just as you and I are saints and sinners, flesh and spirit, living and dying, so Christ was and is many things, even apparently contradictory things, all at the same time. We confess this in the church as the two natures in Christ. It's a mystery. And you know what? We ought to be okay with that. I don't understand how electricity works. It's a mystery to me, but I'm glad it works. I don't know how the internal combustion engine works. That's a mystery to me. But what, I know that when I turn the key in my ignition, electricity causes a spark and starts the engine. And when I put it in gear and step on the gas, it goes. It's a mystery to me. But I don't have to understand the mystery to enjoy the results. When it comes to the mysteries of the faith, human intellect doesn't really help. As Paul said, these things are spiritually discerned. Luther, in his treatise on councils and the councils of the church, gives us a powerful lesson from history on what happens when human reason begins to take over regarding the doctrine of the two natures in Christ. He writes about Nestorianism, which was dealt with by the Council of Ephesus in AD 431. Nestorius denied that Mary could rightly be called the mother of God, which is a problem because it messes with the article concerning the communication of attributes between the divine and human natures of Christ. Listen to Luther. If I were to say, there goes Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, fetching a jug of water and a loaf of bread so that he may eat and drink with his mother, and the same carpenter, Jesus, is the very God, the very true God in one person, Nestorius would say, yes, this is true. But if I were to say, there goes God down the street, fetching water and bread so that he can eat and drink with his mother, Nestorius would say, not so, Dr. Luther. For to fetch water, buy bread, and have a mother, and to eat with her are attributes of human, not divine nature. And again, if I say the carpenter Jesus was crucified by the Jews and the same Jesus is true God, the stories would agree. But if I say God was crucified by the Jews, he says no. For crucifixion and death are attributes of human nature, not divine. 
I don't know if, if you see Luther's problem here with Nestorius, but Nestorius is willing to say that Jesus has a mother and Jesus is God, but he's not willing to say that Mary is the mother of God. Now listen, that's a door that has to swing two ways. Scripture makes it very clear that the human attributes are communicated to the divine nature of Christ and his divine attributes are communicated to his human nature so that Jesus, as God and man, died. Therefore, in Christ, God died. Jesus, also as both God and man, got hungry, tired, and so on. But it also means that Jesus, in his human nature, shares in the divine attributes so that Jesus, according to his human nature, is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent, and so on. Now, one of the important ways this matters is in the Lord's Supper. Whose body and blood do you receive? Jesus. Is it real human body and blood? Yes. There's one, another one of those dualities, by the way. The bread and wine are also the body and blood of Jesus. Well, if Jesus' body is real human flesh, how can he be present here on our altar and at a billion altars all around the world? Because of the communication of attributes. The human nature of Christ can also be omnipresent, just like his divine nature. You may be struggling with this, you may not understand it, but you know what, that's okay. You have to let your faith see these things. Your human intellect will only get in the way. We walk by faith and not by sight, Paul says. Let mysteries be mysteries. Take God at his word and believe what he says. Yes, Jesus was a carpenter, but he was also God. God was born of a virgin. God was nailed to the cross. For in Christ, all the fullness of the Godhead dwells bodily. It's a mystery, a duality, an apparent contradiction. But we confess and proclaim this mystery without having any real hope of persuading people to believe it. But by the Spirit's divine working, some will. And that's a duality too. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, Amen.